So let's look at some other inconvenient observations. If eating more causes obesity, eating less should get rid of the problem. And it doesn't work. If you actually look at what are called meta-analyses, systematic reviews of the data of calorie-restricted diets for weight loss, you'll find the weight loss achieved is, is, quote, so small as to be clinically insignificant. This was actually an observation that was first made in the early 1950s. Um, and the question is, should this be a surprise? And Hilda Brook, who was a leading pediatric obesity researcher in the mid-20th century, put it this way. She said, in obesity, it's the only disorder where what the physician's job is, is to tell the patient to do something, eat less, that it's already been proven they couldn't do. Okay? As a matter of fact, there's a German obesity expert who I'm going to discuss later who said we could define obesity, obese people, as those people for whom eating less doesn't work. The rest of us gain five or ten pounds, we cut back on food, we lose it. The obese person, it doesn't work. If they're in your office, eating less doesn't work. Putting them on a calorie restricted diet shouldn't be expected to work. Next slide. Problem is, exercising more also doesn't work. And I could show you clinical meta analyses demonstrating how you know, small the benefit is, if at all, from increasing your expenditure, but I find this more compelling. 2007, the American Heart Association and the American College of Sports Medicine. Is that good? I love when I give a talk and someone's eating pasta. Um, <laughs> Um, American Heart Association, American College of Sports Medicine publish a joint physical activities guidelines. These are people who want us to work out every day, okay? They believe that physical activity is an inherent part of a healthy lifestyle, just as I do, and you would expect them to spin the evidence to support working out every day. And what they say is this. They say it's reasonable to assume that persons with relatively high daily energy expenditures would be less likely to gain weight over time compared with those who have low energy expenditures, okay? So marathon runners will be more, less likely to gain weight over time than couch potatoes. Another way to put it is if I am a couch potato and I become a marathon runner, that should decrease the likelihood that I'll gain weight over time, logically equivalent. And then they say so far data to support this hypothesis are not particularly compelling. And the interesting thing is this hypothesis is about 150 years old, okay? I mean, you could date it to the 1860s, you could date it to the 1890s. It is an old idea. And if the best you can say about it after 100 to 150 years is that the data to support it are not particularly compelling, the question that I'm asking, the thing I'm saying is maybe the hypothesis is wrong. That's the best bet. When I was studying physics, when I was writing about high energy physics, that's how I started my career, there was an unwritten rule of high energy physics that was called Panofsky's Law. And Panofsky was Pete Panofsky, who founded the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center down the road. He was a Manhattan Project physicist, former presidential science advisor. And Panofsky said, if you throw money in an effect and it doesn't get bigger, it means it's not really there. Okay? And what this means is we've been throwing money at this idea for a century. And I'd like to say probably every exercise machine in this gym has a calorie counter on it. So that you can count how much more energy you're expending and you could stay on it sweating and bored out of your mind watching daytime television until you get to whatever your set limit is, like 400 calories. Will that make you leaner? And the idea is uh, maybe, but the data aren't particularly compelling. Maybe it's wrong. Let's move on. Okay, how many of you have ever tried to practice energy balance, to balance calories in to calories out? Anyone? Okay, a few people. Thank you. Let's just look at what this is a new phrase, by the way. The industry loves this idea. There's actually an association was recently formed that, and the idea was to teach us how to practice energy balance, but they don't tell us what that entails. So I'm going to tell you what that entails. The average American's food intake is about 2,700 calories a day. Next slide. That's about a million calories a year, or 10 million calories in a decade. It's about 10 to 12 tons of food, okay? The reason I say 10 to 12 is because in my book I said 12 and then I found somebody else who said 10 and they seem to be better, but <laughs> 10 to 12. Okay, so now we ask the question, next slide. How accurately do you have to balance calories in to calories out to assure that you don't gain any more than 20 pounds over the course of a decade? Okay, so you're lean in your 20s like many of us were and are, and you don't want to be obese in your 40s because you don't want to gain 40 pounds. So you say, okay, how closely do I have to match energy into energy out on average? And the answer is 20 calories a day. 
If 20 calories a day gets stuck in your fat tissue and you don't burn it, on average you will gain 20 pounds a decade, 40 pounds a year. That's one bite extra food. Like let's say you burn off 106 bites a day and you eat 107 on average, boom, you're going to get obese. If this holds. Next slide. It's a simple calculation, okay? Nothing mystical about this, and somebody should have told us about it 30 years ago. I actually got this calculation from a 1937 nutrition and metabolism textbook. 20 calories a day times 365 days in a year times 10 years divided by 3,500 calories per pound of fat, a reasonable estimate, you get to 21 pounds per decade. Okay? The interesting thing is if you only want to gain 10 pounds a decade, you got it's 10 calories a day. Even better accuracy, if you're keeping your weight stable, if there's anyone here who's weighed the same for 30 years, it's zero. You have perfectly matched calories into calories out. And the point of this exercise, next slide, at 20 calories a day, that's 0.8% accuracy. Nobody can do that. Even if you can, even if the world, the Guinness World Record holder calorie counter was here, so they could get, you know, within 20 calories what they're eating, as long as they eat the same thing every day. Um, they have no idea how much they're expending. We just guess, you know, and if you go to the doctor, they'll do some calculation based on your body size and they'll estimate it. You have no idea. And the reason this calculation was in the 1937 textbook was the idea that none of us can do this. This is impossible. So the question shouldn't be, why is it that some of us are fat? The question should be, why isn't it that all of us are fat? Or that half of us are fat and the other half look anorexic because this calculation goes both ways. And one of the ways you could imagine that this still works is let's say you just start getting fatter, you know, so you put a, you're overshooting by like 40 or 50 calories a day, so you gain 10 pounds, and then you go, well, yeah, God, my clothes don't fit well. And now you undershoot. You walk away from the plate hungry, or you eat not too much, as Michael Pollan tells you, and you lose the 10 pounds, so you oscillate around energy balance. But the question is, how do animals do it? That's how humans do it. How do animals do it? They don't have scales. They're not weighing clothes. This tells us that there's something else regulating our weight. That number alone tells us that something else is regulating your fat accumulation. It's not you consciously matching how much you expend to how much you consume. Next slide. Okay, now I have to apologize. I'm going to show some photos of naked human beings, fat people, obese people. You don't see photos of obese human beings in modern obesity textbooks. Occasionally they'll show a fat rat. Um, these come from pre-World War II European textbooks. And I am now channeling the pre-World War II European hypothesis of obesity. It was different than ours. And they thought you could learn a lot by looking at not just whether or not someone is obese, but how they get fat. So here's a lean set of identical twins, and here's an obese set of identical twins. And what we know, we could say, okay, our calories in, out, energy, overeating hypothesis explains why the obese twins are fatter than the lean twins. They ate more and expended less, and these people practice perfect energy balance. But the question is, why do they have the exact same body type and they have the exact same body type? Okay, Siamese twins don't just, I mean, identical twins don't just have the same faces, they have the same body types. Body types run in families, so what genes control that? The gene for how much you want to eat and how long you want to sit on the couch, or your propensity to watch television? Or is there something else going on that those genes determine that have nothing to do at all with how much calories you eat or expend? Next slide. Um, a good way to look at this is animal husbandry. Um, we've been breeding uh, animals to be more or less fat or for different uh, characteristics for hundreds of years. So here's a lean breed of cattle. It's a Jersey cow. It's a dairy cow. You can see the swollen udder. You can see the ribs. That's how lean it is. And on the right there is an Aberdeen Angus. It's a meat cow. Okay, and you can see how fatty the, uh, the meat is in here, the intramuscular fat that we used to cherish. And so you could ask the question, why is that animal fatter? Why is it bulkier than this animal? And the question is, is it because the gene, we know they're genetic because they're different breeds. And the question is, do the genes that determine this animal's lean, does it determine how much it eats and exercises? Like this animal only grazes 10 hours a day and that animal grazes 12 or this one takes 22 calories per bite and that one gets 31 calories per bite or you know when it gets dark this one goes for jog like that far side <laughs> cartoon and that one goes into the barn and watches television and the answer is that's obviously crazy so here's one way to look at it this is you know all um, sort of ethical issues aside 
This is kind of a machine from our purposes. It takes in fuel here and converts it to milk. And this animal can be considered a machine that takes in fuel and converts it to protein and fat. And we don't want them to be inefficient. We don't want this animal to waste a lot of fuel bulking itself up. We want it all converted into milk, which takes a lot of energy. Okay, if you, when, after you give birth, you know, you're lactating and you're exhausted all the time because your body is using a lot of calories to do this. And in this animal, it's bulking up with muscle and fat. So maybe the genes involved are genes that don't determine how much you eat or exercise, but how you partition, that's a technical term, partition the fuel you do use from, you know, in this case, milk to meat and protein to if we were talking about a gazelle, it might be running over the savanna. So maybe what we're looking at is a fuel partitioning issue, not so much a calories in, calories out issue. Next slide. There are sexual variations in how we get fat. Men tend to get fat above the waist. Women tend to get fat below the waist. Um, both these people would have eaten more and when they were getting fatter. They would have taken in more calories than they expended. But what do the calories have to do with whether the weight goes here or goes here, and in this fellow, he doubled his risk of heart disease by getting fat above the waist. She didn't. So what do the calories have to do with it? Why do we even care? Next slide. Um, puberty is a good way of looking at it. Boys and girls before they enter puberty have roughly the same amount of body fat. Boys go through puberty, they get bigger, they lose fat and gain muscle, or at least they used to. Girls go through puberty, they get bigger, they gain fat and breasts and hips and buttocks. They both get bigger, so they both have taken more calories than they expend, but the boys lose fat and gain muscle and the girls gain fat, so by the time they get out of puberty, the girls have 50% more fat than the boys. What are the calories that you'd have to do with that? Obviously, the growth is driven by growth hormone, we know that, and the sexual variations in fattening and muscle build is driven by sex hormones. So the fact that they took in more calories than they expended is pretty much irrelevant. What we want to know is what are the hormones controlling it. Next slide. Okay. Lipodystrophies. This is a rare lipodystrophy called progressive lipodystrophy. By the 1950s, there were about 200 cases on record, about 80% of them in women. In these cases, the women start to lose fat in the forehead and it moves downward. Okay, that's why it's called progressive. So they lose all subcutaneous fat and it moves downward and then it often stops right above the hips and then you see lower body obesity develop afterwards at a different time. It's not like that the fat goes from here to there. The fat vanishes here and then it accumulates two or three or five years later below the waist. Next slide. So the way these European researchers have said is, are we going to blame the top half on undereating and the bottom half on overeating? <laughs> and if we can't do that, that's obviously absurd. Why is it that we can blame, if we can't blame localized obesity on overeating, why is it we can blame full body obesity on overeating? And if this woman had 10 pounds more above her waist, actually her BMI was over 30, she was obese. But it's obvious she has a lipodystrophy. If she had 5, 10 pounds more of subcutaneous fat, she'd have gone to the doctor and the doctor would say eat more, eat less, exercise more. But we can see just from this kind of a, you know, germ physicists would call this a thought experiment, a Gedanken experiment. If we can't blame that on overeating, how can we blame any obesity on overeating? Next slide. Okay, a little physics. Why do we blame obesity on overeating? Next slide. The law of thermodynamics. Okay, every time somebody argues that obesity is not about overeating, they get accused of not um, believing in the laws of thermodynamics or arguing that they don't hold. One of the high points of my life is I was on the Larry King show with Mehmet Oz and Andrew Weil and Jillian Michaels comes on from California and on national television lectures me on the laws of thermodynamics. And I have a physics degree from Harvard. I was a lousy student. I was like a B minus student. But I understood the laws of thermodynamics. I was literally speechless. You could watch this on YouTube. I mean, I didn't know what to say. And then we went to a break and I turned to Mehmet Oz and made a catty comment about the blank trainer from The Biggest Loser. Um, <laughs> Why overeating? Why do we believe this? Here's the law, first law of thermodynamics is the law of energy conservation. Um, basically, it says you can't create energy from scratch. Energy can't disappear. It can only change form. Energy is neither you know, created nor destroyed. The way it's relevant here is you say delta E, e is a, the energy in a system. The change in energy in a system is equal to E in minus E out. So basically, what we're saying is if a system gets more energetic, more massive, 
has to take in more energy than it expends. And if it gets less massive, it has to let out more energy than it expends. And the, the, for our sakes, delta E is going to be the change in VAT mass, so that's equal to energy consumed minus energy expended. You can't, the energy just doesn't suddenly appear in your gut or on your hips. It had to get there from somewhere else, and you had to expend less to get it there. So this is what the law of thermodynamics tells us. Okay? And what we do to it is interesting. We say, if I take in more energy than I expend, then the energy in my body has to increase. Therefore, taking in more energy than I expend is the cause of obesity. That's where this idea comes from. Next slide. The problem is there's no arrow of causality here. Okay? This is like, a, it's weird, this is an eighth grade science mistake. It's been made in the United States for 50 years. This equation only says if a system gets bigger, if you get fatter, you had to have taken in more energy than you expend. It says nothing about why. There's no causal information involved here at all. And to give you an example how meaningless this is, meaningless this is let me use an anecdote. Imagine you guys want to know why this room is crowded. Okay, so we want to know why we're fat. We want to know why do we have so much energy in our fat tissue? And the answer is, so, you know, instead of saying why do we have so much energy in the fat tissue, you say why is there so much energy in this room in the form of people? And I say to you, because I'm a smart guy, well, that's because more people entered than left. Okay, have I told you anything meaningful? Anything you didn't know? <laughs> so you say, Gary, okay. I mean, of course, more people entered than left. It's crowded. We know that. So why did it get crowded? And I say, ah, but if more people enter than leave, it has to get crowded, right? And now I'm saying the equivalent of if you eat more than you expend, you have to get fatter. And I still haven't told you anything meaningful. Of course, if more people enter than leave, but why is the damn room crowded? And the answer is, well, maybe there's a compelling speaker in here. Maybe it's pouring outside. Maybe there's free bar. I mean, there's a lot of explanations for why the room's crowded that have nothing to do with the fact that thing that we all know for sure, if it's crowded, more people enter than left. Okay, and that's the thing. If you got fat, you had to take in more energy than you expended. That's what the law of thermodynamics tells you. It says nothing about cause. If you get fat, you had to have overeaten for the period during which you were getting fatter. That's a given. But the laws of thermodynamics, physics tells you nothing about why you overate, why you got hungry, why you were lazy or sedentary, and it tells you nothing about why you accumulated fat. And when I lecture in medical schools, this is the idea I want to get across, that if they say obesity is caused by overeating or hyperphagia or energy balance, they're saying the equivalent of this room is crowded because more people left than came in. It's meaningless, literally meaningless. What the, um, NIH tells us and the Surgeon General tells us is a meaningless statement. It says nothing about the cause of obesity.